five memory work. To memory to do memory work with me, you're going to say it out loud at home while I say it out loud on the video. And I will start every recitation with ready, begin. Ready, begin. Sensitivity is using my senses to perceive the true attitudes and emotions of others. I listen to others carefully. I watch facial expressions. I notice tone of voice. I put myself in others' shoes. I show that I care. This is the introduction to the human body song. And I want you to go to your Google Drive and link uh, and, and get the link and listen to it there. And I realize that I'm worried some of you won't do that and I don't wanna sing the whole thing. So let's just read it out loud together. Okay, we're going to start um, right over um, here with um, at verse one. Ready? Again, cells that work together in your body form organs form systems in you. These systems work together to keep your body alive. The nervous system makes them all react so you'll survive. These systems are keeping you alive. Verse two, ready, go. Respiratory systems use oxygen you breathe. In circulatory, blood is pumping by heartbeat. And some waste is excreted through the urinary tract. Hormones come from endocrine and immune will attack. These systems are keeping you alive. Our bodies by the ligaments, the muscular are key. Mathematical thinking is if then thinking and helps me in everyday life. Visualizing math helps me see the way each problem is supposed to be. Checking my work again is better for my brain. Six reasons people miss math problems. Ready, begin. Visualizing, so I imagine the math. Messiness, so I write neatly. Reading, so I carefully read the whole problem. Simple math, so I watch for my mistakes. Transferring, so I double check what I write concepts and then I read it again or ask for help. Timeline dates, ready, begin. Prehistory, first evidence of human migration from Africa to Eurasia. Stone Age, figures painted in Lascaux, France caves. 10,000 BCE, Mesopotamians developed agriculture in Fertile Crescent. 8,000 BCE, South Americans developed cave painting, textiles, and agriculture in Peru. 3,200 BCE, Sumerians invented cuneiform writing. 3,000 BCE, Pharaoh Menes unified upper and lower kingdoms of Egypt. 1,700 BCE, Hammurabi compiled first known law code in Babylon. 1339 BCE, King Tutankhamun entombed in Egypt's Valley of the Kings. 1300 BCE, epic story of Gilgamesh recorded early Mesopotamian culture. 1250 BCE, Greeks fought Trojan War in Anatolia. 1122 BCE, Zhou Dynasty invoked Mandate of Heaven, beginning longest rule of China. 1050 BCE, Phoenicians devised phonetic alphabet. 776 BCE, Greeks held first recorded Olympic Games. 753 BCE, legendary twins Romulus and Remus founded Rome. 587 BCE, Nebuchadnezzar II captured Jerusalem and destroyed its temple. 563 BCE, Prince Siddhartha, later known as Buddha, born in India. 539 BCE, Babylon fell to Persian King Cyrus the Great. 522 BCE, Chinese philosopher Confucius initiated teaching of ethics. 509 BCE, Roman Republic replaced monarchy. 508 BCE, Athenians instituted first democracy. 500 BCE, Greek mathematician Pythagoras proposed round earth theory. 480 BCE, 
classical period began, influenced by Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. 330 BCE, Alexander the Great's conquest spread Greek culture into Egypt and Asia. 221 BCE, Qin Dynasty began constructing Great Wall along China's northern border. 44 BCE, Julius Caesar assassinated in Rome on the Ides of March. 27 BCE, Octavian installed as first Roman emperor. 3 BCE, Jesus Christ born in Bethlehem, Judea. 79 CE, Mount Vesuvius erupted, destroying Pompeii. 476 CE, Western Roman Empire collapsed. Now we'll say the recitation together. We're going to start with the beginning of the title, When I Say Ready, Begin. So, ready, begin. Mark Antony's Funeral Oration from the play Julius Caesar by Shakespeare. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is often toured with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. The noble Brutus hath told you Caesar was ambitious. If it were so, it was a grievous fault and grievously hath Caesar answered it. Here, under leave of Brutus and the rest, for Brutus was an honorable man, so are they all, all honorable men, come I to speak in Caesar's funeral. He was my friend, faithful and just to me, but Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. He hath brought many captives home to Rome, whose ransoms did the general coffers fill, did this in Caesar seem ambitious? When that the poor have cried, Caesar hath wept. Ambition should be made of sterner stuff. Yet Brutus says he was ambitious. And Brutus is an honorable man. You all did see that on the looper call I thrice presented him a kingly crown, which he did thrice refuse. Was this ambitious? Yet Brutus says he was an ambitious, and sure he was an honor he is an honorable man. I speak not to disprove what Brutus spoke, but here I am to speak what I do know. You all did love him once, not without cause. What cause withhold you then to mourn for him? O oh, judgment, thou art fled to brutish beasts, and men have lost their reason. Bear with me, my heart is in the coffin there with Caesar and I must pause till it come back to me. So here's our Western Europe song. I'm gonna use my uh, pointer to point out the countries. You can pause the video and try to point out the countries yourself. Pointing out the countries is a great goal for this. Okay, as we go, uh, we will sing together. Ready, begin. Luxembourg, Liechtenstein, Switzerland. Austria, Belgium, and Netherlands. Sorry, I have to get my thing moving. France and Monaco, Germany are all in Western Europe. Let's do it again. Luxembourg, Liechtenstein, Switzerland. Austria, Belgium, and Netherlands. France and Monaco, Germany are all in Western Europe. And you can find that music on your drive as well. Here is the Roman Empire, obviously taking over Europe as uh, Western Europe as part of the Roman Empire. Just to kind of connect the dots there. Why are we talking about modern countries? Well, that's where the ancient places are that we're studying. Welcome to week 25 character. This week, we're going to talk about some discussion questions. And we just recited our sensitivity. So let that pass, but you can recite it, pause it if you would like to. Here's our discussion questions. As we've been talking about this sensitivity, uh, first of all, what are some things that you can do on a daily basis to put yourself in others' shoes? Now, of course, we're not really putting ourselves in others' actual shoes. What we're trying to do is come from a, someone else's perspective. So what are some things that you can do to make that happen? How can you come from someone else's perspective? Listening is a good way to start with that, just as a hint. Look at our picture here. Tell me more, I'm all ears. A funny animal. Second question is, how do you prefer people to relate to you? And that's a good clue on how to how you might want to relate to other people. 
And you just, it's worth thinking about. What is your preference? Our third question is what can you do to show others that you are thinking about them? And in quarantine, we can use our creativity from last month to be sensitive this month, right? So um, you can look at different ways. I know for a fact that ACE is trying to do that with our pr parade of one. So if you haven't gotten your parade of one video, uh, picture in, not video, but just a picture of you holding up a sign, um, we're doing that to try to demonstrate sensitivity in character. So it'll be really fun. Our last question is, how does it make you feel when you know someone is willing to help you, even when they don't know how to help you? Does it make you feel good that they're willing? That's something to think about also. So have fun discussing those with your family. You can pause this and discuss it now if you'd like to, or later. Welcome to week 25, Humanities, Art, Music, and Timeline Date. Just to go through this again, we are talking about uh, our music appreciation piece for the whole month. We're um, studying the Hallelujah Chorus from the uh, musical Messiah. And this is a piece that is uh, compiling kind of like the historical, it was written in 1741. And it's going over that, uh, that storytelling of the biblical account of God's promises as spoken by the prophets. And then it ends with Christ's glorification in heaven. We're talking about this piece because first of all, it's a super famous musical piece by George Frederick Handel. And here he is right here. And second of all, um, when we discuss the piece, um, we are connecting the dots to our study this week, which is Roman and the Roman Empire religion conflict that happened. Um, so we already studied a little bit about Honda last week. Um, definitely try to listen with your ear. Um, you can push on the link here for uh, um, uh, to listen to the piece, or you can go down and listen to the YouTube. Click on that uh, on the slideshow. We just want you to enjoy all of the uh, music that we have out there for you. Okay, so uh, our art appreciation piece this month, this whole month, is the Pantheon. I didn't put it in here, but I want you guys to consider looking up the 360 cities. Um, it's 360 cities, and it's implying that you can go to any most any ma major landmark or city in the world and get a 360 de degree view from it. We did that for the Great Wall of China in our Dialectic One class last week. It was awesome. Um, you can go to the Mars rover out in space. You can go to the Colosseum in Rome. You can go to the Pantheon of Rome, many other landmarks in Rome, and enjoy looking as if your computer is standing in the middle of the space, and it will turn all the way around and let you see the whole space. So um, that's a fun work website. I don't have it linked here, um, but I definitely want you to uh, click, go ahead and look up 360 Cities, um, and the Pantheon is a really awesome one. Our timeline date this week is the 44 BCE Julius Caesar assassinated in Rome on the Ides of March. The Ides of March is the middle of March. The middle of March is March 15th, which is kind of actually when we all went into quarantine, ironically. Um, if you ever have to remember back to 2020 when you went into quarantine, you can think, ah, it was the Ides of March. So I have recommended today uh, kind of the YouTube channel that I'm kind of uh, exploring and with you and recommending to you this week is the Infographics Show. Uh, this whole week we're talking about some stuff that's a little bit violent. So um, some of the links are not actually provided by me. Parents should check them out first, depending on what your kid can handle. It is all history. It's a great history version, but it's also kind of violent. So um, younger kids might want to watch out for that. Um, but for this one, this is not violent. This is Julius Caesar's life. And um, you can check it out. And there's a great 12 minute video there for you. So just to kind of connect the dots, Julius Caesar was assassinated because he did some stuff that made people mad at him, right? People don't get assassinated unless someone's mad at you. And so um, let's go back and talk about our recitation. In our recitation, in the Shakespeare play, um, the speaker who is Brutus, uh, or not Brutus, the speaker, Mark Antony, makes comments about how um, Brutus says he was ambitious and um, people are saying that he's ambitious and uh, making kind of mockery of that in Mark Antony's speech. 
Well, the truth was Julius Caesar was actually ambitious. The guy wanted to move the borders of the Roman Empire and and grow it, which means taking over other people's houses. And that's kind of like me going over to your house and and deciding to take over your house. Like we don't do that in the United States, but that's what Julius Caesar wanted to do. And to do that, he went to a very special place called the Rubicon. Now it's a river. It's called the Rubicon River, but no one calls it the river. They just say the Rubicon and they all know it's a river. And here it is at the kind of the north of your, of Italy. And Julius Caesar came from down here in Rome um, and took his troops up to the Rubicon. And I'm going to tell you the whole story now, starting now. And took his troops to the other side of the Rubicon River, which was a sign that he was trying to take over other lands. Well, at the time, the Senate, remember, it was run by a republic, which means ruled by the people. And the people who were in charge were the senators. The senators said, stop now. Don't go any farther. In fact, come back now. And they told Julius Caesar, do not cover across the Rubicon. Um, come back down to Rome. So Julius Caesar got across the Rubicon and decided he better obey. He did not want to. And he obeyed anyway. And he came back in, in the year 60 BC. Well, he went all the way back down to Rome. And uh, this is kind of a picture. Um, he ended up going down to Rome. I don't know where Julius Caesar is in this picture. It's an art, uh, you know, it's an artist's a uh, example of what it may have looked like. There are angels here with trumpets uh, talking about how this must have been divine that this happened, um, that uh, the crossing of the Rubicon was something that Julius Caesar was asked to do by God is what the angels are implying there. And uh, and at the time, um, he, he did go home to Rome, but then 12 years later, um, in 48 BC, he came you know we're going from 60 closer to zero so 48 12 years later he waited and finally went up and crossed the rubicon when he crossed the rubicon um the the story goes that the you know that god wanted this to happen the god, the roman gods wanted this to happen and um he thought that it was a great idea but it ended up causing a complete act of war uh, people believed it was treason. He was going against the government. He was doing exactly what he was told not to do. This is way bigger than if you, if your parents tell you not to do something like, you know, you're not supposed to play with a dog right now and you go play with the dog anyway. That is an act of insurrection. You're doing exactly what your parents told you not to do. You need to do, you need to obey. If they say empty the dishwasher, you have to obey. And if you don't, that's called insurrection. Well, this is a way bigger deal for the whole country because the, the whole country started fighting after this. And it, it was it kicked off the Roman Civil War because Julius Caesar was rebelling against what the senators had said. Well, he believed that he had absolute power. Absolute power means I don't have to obey the Constitution. I don't have to obey the senators. I can do what I want to do. And he, this ended up changing things from a republic, which was run by the people, to an empire, which was run by one person, an absolute monarchy, where one person rules. Well, the, the story goes that when Julius Caesar uh, crossed the Rubicon, he said, uh, I'll let, I'll, let me see if, Alea Iacta, Iacta Est, Alea Iacta Est. And what he was saying was the die is cast. Things have changed from now on. We're not going back to a republic where everything's going to be an uh, absolute mar monarchy from now on. I am in charge. And that was huge. So Julius Caesar wanted to do some really nice things. Um, let me go forward a couple slides. He wanted to make some awesome reforms. He established order um, in the people. He was a brilliant guy. He was um, he not only designed things better in the city to make it less congested, to use the marshy land that was there and change the marshy land into farmland or land for houses, but he also gave jobs to the poor, land to the poor, citizenship to people who had recently been outcasts. And he tried to just rejuvenate and unify all of Rome. 
He said that uh, the tax laws should be revised. Um, he changed the calendar, as we all know, but that helped with lots of other aspects of government and economics and just anything in the city, basically, he wanted to help out. So that resettled the uh, kind of the decisions uh, in his mind that he was a good ruler. He was trying to do the best for the people, but let me go backwards. Um, his enemies still didn't like him. He even like granted like, uh, what's it say? Pardons. He granted pardons to the senators that had been in trouble. He said, you guys can get out of jail free. Um, he didn't take over by violence. Uh, usually, all, you know, a lot of leaders would take over, but do it violently and kill lots of people. But they, they, he didn't do that, but they still did not like him. And this ended up leading to him being assassinated. Uh, the, you know, uh, Brutus and Gaius, Cassius, um, assassinated him or led the, the people to assassinate him because they thought he was destroying the Republic, which he was. He wanted to be the emperor. And, um, and that, uh, you know, changed everything. So that's 44 BC. If you, if you, you can remember the Rubicon thing started in, in 60 BC. So in not very long, just in 16 years, he has done all those reforms, tried his best to help the people, but did, um, and, and was ambitious in many ways, but he ended up getting assassinated, even though he'd done a lot of good things. So um, he was this great visionary. He was trying to do the um, best. And when he was assassinated, um, it you know it was because uh, a lot of those leaders did not like him. So and this kind of um, sums up things. He said it's in, in not in English, but in Latin, he said, it is easier to find men who will volunteer to die than to find those who are willing to endure pain with patience. Um, because he said, gosh, I know it's painful to go through all these changes. So just be patient. And he said that men really have a hard time being patient, but they'll volunteer to die like as a soldier, but being patient is not a virtue that they have. So he's also the one that's famous for saying, I came, I saw, I conquered, which obviously shows he was ambitious. Um, and in Latin, of course, you have studied that means weenie weedy weeky. So that's, I think, in Primer A that you learn that, a weenie weedy weeky. Um, I came, I saw, I conquered. So there you go. That's the part about Julius Caesar. Now, welcome to week 25, Rome and religion. And please, I know I'm doing a lot of talking. It's hard to stay engaged. Feel free to draw, build with blocks, write with notes, build with Legos, build a Parthenon with some Legos. Um, do something interesting so you can keep listening because I know that we're trying to find a way to connect with you, even though we're in this hard situation. So, um, okay. So Christianity and Rome, uh, this topic is our first one today. Uh, I started off just giving you kind of some visual images of what Jesus Christ of, uh, or Jesus of Nazareth may have looked like, uh, we have no clue what he looked like. There are some theories, but we know for sure he was not blonde haired, blue eyed and white skinned. Um, that, that image of a blonde haired, blue eyed, white skinned Jesus got put out there in history, probably by Albert Durer, Durer one of the middle ages um, artists and um, I, maybe by other people too. But for whatever reason, you know, people have pictured him that way. Here are some better pictures. Um, you know, he's uh, of African descent, possibly, or at least dark skin. Um, he may, he's definitely Arabian um, and not white. So here's some images you can go with um, just to kind of give you an overview of who he was and why we're introducing him to this Rome conflict is that he's a central figure of Christianity. Um, most Christians believe he is the incarnation of God, the son, or, or God, the son made like a human and is uh, the person who is the awaited Christ or savior prophesied in Jewish writings. So uh, we have Roman historians and letters from that time documenting a variety of stories about this lower class man named Jesus. He never became a king. He never had lots of money or any money. And um, according to the historians, but he affected things for thousands of years in the future. Right? So um, one of the, the major Christian leaders of the time was named Saul of Tarsus. 
and I call him a Christian leader, but let me back up a little bit. He was a man, we don't know what he looked like, but here's some possible depictions of what he may have looked like. Um, he was raised as a Jew inside the Roman Empire. Very strictly, he did all the things Jews want uh, Jews to do. He studied and ruled the, the Jewish religion and also um, had a lot of power from the Roman Empire. So he had this kind of citizenship of Judaism and citizenship of Rome, double citizen. And he was a Jew or you can call it a Hebrew or an Israelite. Um, and he, all those three are the same, Jews, he Hebrews, and Israelites. And um, he, those, that faith believes that there's going to be a savior who will come and take over the world like a military leader. And he thought that would happen um, and, and the, the savior would come take over the Roman Empire. Um, and so he actually hated people who followed Jesus. He fought and killed people who followed Jesus of Nazareth. At the time, they called it the way. For many years, they called Christianity the way. And he hated this, this system that they had. Um, the Christians at the time believed that they should throw out all religion and forms of religion, the people who are following Jesus. So, of course, this guy is very religious, and he, he thinks that's just terrible. So, um, eventually, he is killing Christians, and then he has an experience where he starts seeing Jesus of Nazareth as that Savior. And... Uh, through this, he went blind or in this whole story. And because of that, he flipped completely and he forgot his Judaism and um, tried to put away. Uh, and, and he believed that Jesus Christ was that savior that he had been waiting for. And he changed his name to Paul, which is a normal thing to do, changing your name. And he started leading and being a leader inside of this group called The Way. Um, and he started spreading this good news that Jesus was the way, the salvation for Jews, Romans, and everyone in the whole world. And he wanted then to be known um, as an apostle or a follower. And he changed his name to the Apostle Paul. Well, he traveled all over the place um, and he wrote letters. And this is a letter we have. Um, you can go to museums and see the old letters. He wrote many letters that are still uh, we don't know which ones are original, which ones are copies, but there are many of the same letters out there. And he started here in the Jerusalem area, and then he moved um, all over the whole Mediterranean. Um, he, at first, he just stayed over here in this area, but eventually he got all the way over to Rome, and that's where he was killed, and um, he was beheaded. Um, and Christianity spread. And because Christianity represented a faith system with one God and the Roman Empire loved a religion that was full of many gods, there became a huge conflict. So we're going to be talking about that in our slides um, in a couple uh, slides forward, about how much of a conflict this caused to have this, these two different faith systems inside um, the Roman Empire. I did uh, recommend that you go to the infographic show. You can search for Rome in their videos or ancient Rome. And um, if you have a parent's permission, you can check those out. Um, I just didn't want to watch every single video completely. There's a lot of good ones, but I just wanted you to watch for violence. Um, there's a lot of how did they die kinds of things that ended up happening. So to break from that for a second, we're going to go to the next topic. Um, this is about a Greek writer named Plutarch. Uh, he wrote in Greek, as you can tell, in this papyrus. Uh, there are Greek letters there. And he wrote uh, writings called The Lives of Noble Greeks and Romans. And these writings have been around for 2,000 years. Um, same with Paul's letters. And um, we read these here at ACE, uh, translations of the Greek into English, and we get to enjoy them. So they're biographies um, of famous men and they don't have any women, I don't think, but mostly men. And they show their moral virtues, which are good things, or their failings, which are bad things. And the goal was to explore the character of these of the good guys and the bad guys and just enjoy examining how they ended up with that kind of character. And the goal was not to tell history. The goal was to, you know, enjoy looking at the character. And so we've had many, many copies of it over the years. It says translated from Greek here. 
Um, you can get copies that are as old as the 1800s. And he, t he wrote about like Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, Mark Antony, Cicero, Romulus, just so many historical figures. And then after he got done talking about two of them, he would then have like a writing where he contrasted and compared them and talked about, you know, how they compared to each other. Um, really getting into the idea of character development. So really interesting that that concept of character development has been around for 2000 years. Pretty cool. Actually longer than that, but okay. Now I'm going to tell you a story about the Jews. Remember I mentioned that the Jews belonged in, um, uh, I could have talked about this one first. The Jews have been around at this point for a couple thousand years and they live in the Roman empire. And uh, if we cruise forward in time to 132 to 135 AD, um, they've been around for a long time. They've been existing in the Roman Empire where they believe in the Roman gods with Christianity, who says it doesn't like religion at all, and it just wants to follow the way. And then you have this Judaism that loves structure and, and very orderly worship and uh, more of a religion, a formal religion. Well, um, along came Emperor Hadrian. Uh, Hadrian was not a well-liked, he did not, he was one of those emperors that did not love to do what's good for the people, right? We talked about that last week, how some emperors tried very hard to do what was good for the people, and some emperors cared for themselves much more than the people. Well, he decided to restrict the Jewish practices in the empire and uh, not let them have their worship practices. In fact, their holy city of Jerusalem was uh, a place that they could not go into anymore. And he destroyed the actual city and the temple where these people believed that that was their, the spirit of God in that temple. And he destroyed it. It was very terrible. Well, along came Bar Kokhba. And Bar Kokhba means the son of Kokhba. So Bar, the son of. Um, and he led the revolt against the Romans. And um, in here, I'll show you a picture. He hid the rebels or the people who, who wanted to worship um, the way they wanted to worship in a cave. And now we, I've been to the Middle East. There are caves everywhere. Caves are very, very common. And here is an actual cave. We have archaeological evidence to show that this is, was from that revolt. revolt. And then along came an archaeologist right here named Yagaliel. A Yadin. I might be saying that wrong, but Yigal Yadin. And this archaeologist was a Jewish man, an Israeli man, who found this roll of papyrus right here that is very well preserved. And he found it in a cave, the cave of letters in the Judean desert. And it has the story of Bar Kokhba's ancient orders to the rebels telling them to keep revolting. And um, they did eventually gets you know killed by the romans and hadrian had his way was not um good to them but we you know we get to see one more story where the jews for some reason have been just you know tried to be slaughtered and killed over and over and over again through history and here's one more of those time periods very interesting um they hid out here at the hervat itri and that um you know, village was there. And at the time it was destroyed during the revolt, that's documented. Um, and we can see evidence of that here. Fantastic structures. Look there, you know, cement and everything. It's just really well put together. Really interesting. Next, we um, kind of flip back to that Christian um, persecution that was happening, right? So we know that uh, at first the you know, Jesus uh, and Paul and the Christianity started to spread. Paul took a boat all over the Mediterranean and tried to spread Christianity ideas everywhere. And then um, Jesus Christ was uh, um, uh, like crucified about 30 AD. So then 34 years after he was killed, people are still following his ideas, even though he's died and they're still dying to, to not, um, have to uh, give in. And uh, it, it ended up happening that a fire broke out in Rome 
and we don't know exactly why. And there's rumors that about Nero starting the fire. Um, Nero is known to be psycho, um, just a real terrible person for, he killed people and he was out of his mind. Um, and he's known for those kinds of things. There are rumors about specific things that he did that may or may not be true. Um, but he needed someone to blame. So the fire's here, it happened, it's killed a lot of people, it's been terrible, it destroyed the city. So he blamed the Christians. And he said, Christians have um, you know, done all of this, so let's round them up, group them up, and kill them. And then he decided to experiment with how to kill more viciously, and he um, killed them many different ways, burning them alive, crucifying them, throwing them to the dogs. It was very terrible. Um, and that Christian persecution thing started and it went on for a couple hundred years. Um, Nero, of course, did not live that long, but he still enjoyed this. He would have people have a party. So you can see people who are enslaved here, um, you know, having to carry this, you know, uh, chaise lounge for someone to sit there and enjoy watching. <clears throat> These people don't look very happy. They're watching. It looks terrible. And what are they watching? Look up here in the circle. They're watching this awful method of, of killing where they actually are going to torch this hay that's all around this person, which is just morbid and terrible. And that kind of persecution um, is well documented by Roman historians. It's just really awful. Well, um, the investigator, the reason this was getting so bad is the, the Roman historians and government officials, they were looking into the Christianity concept. And because the Christianity concept did not believe in like a form of religion, um, even though it was a religion in itself, they didn't have like, you know, a specific order to how they did things. Um, they, they ended up hating them. And the Roman Empire... Uh, thought that basically the Christians were saying we hate the Roman gods, which um, was true. And they, they, the um, Romans would say, if you will worship the Roman gods, I won't kill you. And the Christians would not give in. They said, no, we're not going to do that. We're staying true to our God. And then that ended up making Christians get killed. Um, eventually... 306 AD, long time forward, we have a guy named Constantine, becomes um, the ruler. We're not going to talk about him a lot this year, but the persecution went all the way up to the 300s. Um, here's another uh, artist's rendition of what it may have looked like in the Colosseum. Uh, we have all the people watching, thousands and thousands of people watching, and we have a whole bunch of what um, historians you know, say Christians were... Uh, you know, thrown into the Colosseum and the um, and fed to the lions, tigers, and bears. And uh, lions, tigers, and bears is kind of a phrase from that stage. They put lots of um, you know very uh, vicious animals in there and uh, let nature take its course. Very terrible. So this is artists. We weren't there. We don't have real pictures, but this is an artist's rendition of that. Well. The Christians got so persecuted and um, so many people were trying to kill them. They decided to move their worship services underground. Um, the cemeteries uh, were, you can't just dig into the dirt in, uh, in that area as easily. So you bury your people in caves uh, at the time or in, in stone boxes. And uh, these areas where they have uh, these kind of rectangle bed looking areas, that's actually a catacomb where they would lay a dead body. And the whole fa the whole hallway would belong to one family. So like the early wine family would own this whole hallway and all the early wine ancestors would be here. And I would own that area. Well, the people who are following Jesus or the way um, opened up, you know, they would allow people to be buried in their family catacomb, which is kind of unusual. And then it eventually became a place where they would worship and they would go down there to worship. And we have evidence of that because um, they did frescoes <laughs> and they, they have lots of writings about it. But 
throughout the whole first century, um, which is the, you know, zero to 100, um, the Christians would paint these, um, you know, artworks. This is called the Good Shepherd. This is a picture of the story Jesus told um, where he, there's a, a lamb that he went out to look for that was missing. And he went out and found one lamb and put it on his shoulders and brought it back home. And that is a fresco where the paint is mixed with the, the, the um, cement and painted together. So you can, I mean, I can't go there probably, but archaeologists can still go there and see that. Um, they have all kinds of art. I'll show you another slide. Here's another version of a catacomb, not quite as ancient. Here is a picture of uh, people who are worshipers, for example, um, <clears throat> going down to the catacombs to worship. They had to bring torches down there and sing praises to their God. And here's another picture of a catacomb. They're all over the place in Rome, but also through the whole Mediterranean area. And, um, and then here's another picture, this fish is here and then that's supposed to be bread loaves on top of it this is a painting from inside uh the catacombs as well and it's lasted a long long time two thousand years this paintings lasted they would also carve shapes um on the stone the marble stones that they would close up these catacombs with um and those shapes became symbols for who was a christian and who was you know safe for christians to talk to and who was not safe and um, they just were not trusted. They were blamed for everything. And so they were sent to prison. They were killed and um, sent out of the country to live. And um, you can still see these pictures today. Well, before we're finished, I want to talk about um, our government topic. So welcome to week 25, Humanities Government. First of all, we're going to talk about divine right. Well, actually, this is the last thing we're going to talk about. So I told you that Caesar was assassinated and that his nephew uh, was going to be able to take over. Um, I took, I put Caesar here, but that's wrong. Take off the word Caesar. Um, after Caesar's assassination, a comet sailed the, through the sky. So at that time, they didn't know why comets were sailing through the sky. They didn't have electricity like we do. And they were outside a lot more. <clears throat> and they would look up and see, you know, any kind of movement in the heavenly bodies or the stars, and they thought it was just fantastic and must be something from God. And they believed that when Caesar got assassinated, that star meant that he, that was his spirit going up to the heavens. So Caesar, it was killed and his spirit was going up to take a place among the gods. And that meant that Caesar must be from the gods or divine. So um, Octavian ended up, um, you know, it was his nephew and took over um, because he believed that he was the son of God, because though he was the nephew, he was an heir or like a, in the line of a God. And this idea made it so that Octavian believed he could rule with permission from the gods. And that meant he thought he had extra power because he was appointed as a ruler of, you know, by God. And that extra power, I mean, I will read you the Latin really quickly. The Venus Julius, divine Julius. So after Julius Caesar died, he became known as a divine leader. And uh, they, they decided that you should rule directly from the gods. And the people should not be in charge anymore. It should be uh, somebody who has been given permission from the gods. And that God-appointed right to rule changed everything moving forward. So as we leave today, something you can go home and discuss, um, and you're already, already at home, ha ha ha, um, is, uh, first of all, you can read these questions with me. Is it right for Augustus to use religion to gain power? He used that idea of divine right to get more power. Is that right or wrong? The second question, to what extent should religion play in who becomes the ruler? <clears throat> should religion be part of who becomes the ruler? Third of all, are there such things today as God-appointed rulers? Um, that's something that's really pertinent right now. We have a ruler who is rumored to have died on earth right now in 2020. And that is a fascinating um, idea 
to, to wonder how that country is going to change uh, based on that person dying because they believe that person came from the gods as well. So um, really, really fantastic uh, conversations that you can have about that. So I'm just really grateful that you guys stuck with me this long. I know that it's a lot of work to, um, to get going on humanities. So have a great week.